Good morning, everyone. My name is Mion Kun from MMM Group. Today, I'm going to talk about the modeling of post tension cement box girders using a case study of Calgary West RLT. First, I will start with to have an overview. We're going to talk about the post tension cement concrete bridges. And then second part is the, is the case study of the Calgary West ARLT. The third part will go over the modeling techniques and applications in the design process, followed by a conclusion. So what are cemental concrete br bridges? Cemental concrete bridges are building short pieces of concrete sections, one piece at a time. The concrete segments can be cast in place or precast. We usually have large crane sizes, referred to as gantry, and they are typically used to erect the precast segments. Or slip forms are used to produce cast in place concrete. Then the segments are joined together by applying a high compressive force from high strength bundle wires, referred to as strands. This slide is showing a precast segment in a batch plan. This picture is showing the precast segment that is going to be used for balanced cantilever construction. And the second picture is showing the precast segments that is being erected using the overhead gantry. This picture is showing a 19 strand tendon that is going to be stressed. And the last picture is showing the tendon stressing in operation. So the working crew is aligning the, the jack and make sure that they are in line with the number of um, with the strands. This slide is, we're going to talk about some of the issues that needs to be considered in cemental bridge construction. Cemental bridge construction can be used to build bridges having span length from about 24 meter to 450 meter, depending on the types of construction method. If the scale of project is large, meaning there are many repetitions of similar span length, limited site access due to active highway or railway traffic or above water body, cemental bridge construction can be very economical. Because the segments are usually precast, you can include various aesthetic features on a precast segment. The, pre the precast segments are usually produced in a precast plant. And as a result, the quality assurance or the quality control can be easily established. And due to the complexity of the equipment used and erection methods, continuing engineering surface surfaces are typically required during various stages of construction, such as tendon stressing and girder ally alignment control. So before an owner or the design engineer consider using cemental bridge construction, these are the common factors that we will have to consider first. We're going to talk about various types of cemental bridge construction. And those four, four common types are the span by, the span, by span method, the balance cantilever, incremental launching, and the last one is the cable stay bridge construction. The span by span method can be used for a span range 
up to about 45 meter. And this method provides very high speed construction and can be used over or parallel to existing highway. The gantry consists of a steel truss with front and rear supports. The speed of erecting one span is typically one, ban one span per four days. Forgot to mention about that this picture is obtained from the VSL systems. This picture is showing the balanced cantilever method. The balanced cantilever method can be typically applied on span range between 48 meters and 135 meter. Although span as long as 240 meter has been built before. The segments are being erected and stressed in a more or less symmetrical manner about the pier. Tendons are typically placed in in the bottom near the midspan and in the deck over the pier. As construction progresses to the midspan, a close report is performed to complete the span. Erection speed is typically two to three piers per day. Next, we go over to incremental launching. This method is used on span range between 30 meter and 90 meter. This method is not normally used in environmental sensitive areas where construction access is limited to one end of the bridge. Unlike the span by span or the balance cantilever method, no overhead gantry is used. Each span is cast and stressed in a casting bed at, a, at, a, at an abutment as it is attached to a steel launching nose. And the launching nose is attached to the first segment to reduce the bending moment and stress in the girder segments. This method can be used on both strict and curved alignment. The launching mechanism is achieved by means of high capacity hydraulic jacks and low friction sliding bearings with lateral guides. The cable state bridge construction method is used when the span is beyond the limits that can be handled by the above described methods. In this case, parallel and state cables are used in conjunction with balanced cantilever method to bridge the gap. And this method can erect further segments spanning between 150 meter and 450 meters. The picture that is on this that are on this slide are the new Portman bridge that is currently under construction. Let's go over some of the typical concrete bus girder session. For single cell bus girder, it is preferable because of its high torsional resistance, ease of construction and inspection access. If you have a constant girder depth, the typical span to depth ratio is ranging from 15 to 30, and the optimal value is about 18 to 20. The top flange width is usually limited to six times the bus girder depth, and it can be pushed all the way up to 18 meter. However, if your width to depth ratio exceeds six, a more rigorous analysis is required, and may require and may require longitudinal edge beams at the tip of the cantilever to distribute loads acting on the cantilevers, and a shear lag analysis may also be warranted. Your web spacing is typically maintained about 4.6 meter to 7.6 meter. Top flange thickness is, a, is about 200 mil, and your minimum rib web thickness is 180 mil. If you have a very wide bridge deck, and this is usually accommodated by 
linking several large bus girders together by putting a, um, a closer pore a, or a closer joint between the bus girders. This picture is showing a typical girder box session. As a matter of fact, um, this picture is extracted from the ASBI, the, the American Segmental Box Girder Institute website, and they're working in conjunction with the ASHPO. And on their website, there are a list of standard box girder sessions for designers or engineers or owners to establish a pr preliminary bus girder design. Let's go for some of the major components of cemental bus girders. In cemental bridge construction, longitudinal post tension is used to resist the vertical bending moment under the self weight of girder segments, construction loads, and life loads. Sometimes transfers post tension is used in the deck to resist locally high transfers moment due to large cantilever or life load. Longitudinal post tensioning is used is usually achieved through external tendons, whereas transfers post tensioning is used is usually achieved through internal tendons. This picture here is showing a tip a generic or typical tendon profile um, external tendon profile on a typical um, span. This picture is showing six tendons anchored at a deviator at mid span. Very often, a shroud band is used to span over an existing highway or railway because a pier column is not allowed at the in the middle of existing highway or railway. Also, the dimensions of the cabin is limited to a certain size due to a vertical, a vertical clearance or aesthetic purposes. And so to increase the moment capacity of the cabin to resist the high reaction from the self-weight of the girder segments and life load, internal transverse post-tensioning is used and the connection between the bent columns and the cabin can be an integral or a pin connection. Another major component of cemental bus girders are, are the, pre the pre stressing strands. Usually, each strand is composed of seven bundle wires, low re relaxation, and a number for, the re for low re relaxation is usually within 5% five per five tensile strength of the Strand is 1860 MPA. The size of the diameter of the strand is usually 13 mil or 15 millimeter diameter. And that comes out to be 99 millimeter square or 140 millimeter square. The duct size, which is used to house the, the tendons, has to be a minimum 2.5 larger than the net area of the post tension uh, strands. The most important thing here uh, for tendons is the corrosion protection. Usually you want to provide a six levels of corrosion protection. The first one is your membrane or sealant at the exterior surface of concrete. Next one is your concrete, concrete cover. The next one is um, the HDPE or the high density polyethylene nut. Next one is your grout. And then next level is sheet sheathing or you know, coating. And this last one would be uh, having a proper uh, design detailing. And also construction procedures. This picture is showing the level of corrosion protection for internal tendons. And again, um, 
courtesy to um, FHWA. In this picture is showing the corrosion protection to the uh, external tendons. It is worth noting that it is worth noting that a drain pipe is um, is typically uh, designed to make sure that the, uh, there is no trapped uh, moisture inside the uh, enclosed box girder. In other major component for um, cement box girders are the external deviators and the anchorage blocks. External deviators are used as intermediate anchorage point to transfer the vertical component of the post tensioning force. However, um, the anchorage blocks it provide an anchorage point at the end of the span to develop the required post tensioning tensioning forces. It also provide a jacking area for the post tensioning equipment. And because the tendon stressings occurs at the anchorage blocks, therefore um, it's Special attention and design details are required to increase the levels of corrosion protection and anchorages. This picture is showing the tendon stressings at anchorage block. So some of the design aspects of post-tension box girders the design codes that engineers normally follow are the Ashto LRFD, which designs specifications, and the Ashto guide guide specifications for design and construction of cemental concrete bridges. The Canadian code lightly touched on the design of post tensions um, box girders, so usually engineers refer to the Ashto code for the design of post tension. Um, box girders. At the ultimate low cases, you um, normally consider the flasher, shear, and torsion, um, and the axial force. And also, um, you have to look at the bursting, the bursting at anchorages, making sure that your um, post tensioning forces is not too high, and also the jacking of superstructure during launching. Um, this is um, this will have to be considered if your um, superstructure, superstructure is go is um, is erected by inc incremental launching. At the surf at the surface limited surfaceability limit state, um, stress within concrete segments and at segment joints will need to be considered. One of the major um, um, issue is um, that. The box girder segments are not opened up or can have a gap during um, the, the surface life. So it is very important, or typically, um, we want to maintain the con um, the the stress level within the concrete segments to be uh, under compression. Next one you have to look at is the fatigue in your um, tendon, uh, in your post-tension tendons, deflection, and also seek width. Deflection is um, one of the major parameter that um, guide structure will, um, is becoming important. Some of the factors that can affect the expected the expected performance of post tension concrete bridges. Concrete mix temperature, crimp and shrinkage, cure, the curing methods, and strings or any secondary effects, the tendon losses, construction sequence and parties, and erection loading. Based on my based on my experiences, these factors they all need to be considered throughout the, the entire design process and they are all interrelated to each other and will affect the required number of 
strengths and tendons, tendon profile, in construction method, and cost. That was the end of the first part. Let's um, get started on the Calgary West LLT case study. And I have pre prepared you a video. And the length of this video is about five minutes. Four minutes, actually. The, Cal the Calgary West LLT. The total length of the Calgary West LLT is about 8 km, extending from the west end of 7th Avenue downtown to 69th Street southwest. This transit corridor consists of track works on elevated guideway, trenches, 
tunnels and grounds. Test run has already begun earlier this year, and the expected opening schedule for public service is in early spring 2013. The total length of the elevated highway is about 1.5 km, and it consists of a number of standard segments of 30 meter, 33 meter, and 36 meter single span segments, and two continuous spans constructed using the span bus span method, as well as a four span continuous structure using the balance cantilever method. Just give you some geographical reference. What it shows here is the start of the Calgary West LRT. And this is the Elephant Street Southwest. Over here is the Bow Trail Southwest, Bow River. And this is the Miwata Bridge, which was parallel to the north. So the north arrow is pointing toward this way. This picture is showing um, an, another erected gallery segments. This is the type of launching trusses that is used to erect all the prepared segments on Calgary West LRT. This picture is showing the steel truss that is going to be assembled to form part of the gantry, uh, the overhead gantry. This picture is showing the cured end segment at the batch plant and you can see that all the inserts that are left in place for the post-tension tendons and this picture is showing the steel form for the end segment casting this picture is showing the preparation of the re reinforcing cage for all the standard galway segment, all the reinforcing is galvanized, and this is one of the requirements for the project. Picture on the left is the precast cement for balance cantilever picture on the right is the precast cement for the span by span method and the weight of these two cements is roughly in the order of 26 metric ton this picture is showing the erected precast cement constructed using the span by span method and you can see that all the joints between the segment they are joined using a epoxy grout this picture is showing the erratic order segments using the balance cantilever method for your reference the height of this pier is in the order of 19 meters to just to quickly mention about the seismic design of the Calgary West LRT Calgary is now sitting in Calgary is now sitting in an active seismic zone so therefore um, and however because of the importance of this skyway 
structure that is categorized, categorized as a lifeline uh, bridges. So therefore, um, the seismic design performance is for this project is um, seismic performance zone two, and therefore the seismic design is detailed and uh, is detailed accordingly. And in these cases, the um, we know the we know design is one of the major um, design issue on um, on this gallery structure. This picture is showing the walking crews um, doing the tendon stressings at the end segment. And you can see that um, the, the two gentlemen at the back is looking at the dial gauge and making sure sure that the tendon, the level of, ten, of the tendon stressing is controlled accurately. This picture is showing the two span continuous um, with in integral connection at the straddle band. The construction was built over an active CP railway. This segment is curved in alignment, which makes it more difficult in detailing. The temporary formworks was used to support the cab beam. This picture showing the in the internal post tension tendon in the straddle band. This picture is showing the curing condition um, during the winter time. The working crew is preparing the formwork and also the reinforcing cage for um, for the guideway plumes because uh, due to the winter condition uh, a walking tent was set up to ensure that a proper curing condition could be achieved and that was the end of the second part and we'll move on to the third part which is the modeling demonstration of a two-span continuous structure. And here is the finished product. Giving you some general idea of the plan view. The length of this structure is 36 meter on the west band and 42 meter on the east span. The superstructure gallery is made in was made integral with the band 10 and expansions at pier 11 and, and pier 9. Another section showing the elevation view. Just to give you some general idea of the size of these oscillators. For on the category West LLT, the, the overall bridge width of the oscillators is in the order of 9.6 meter and the overall Bosker depth is in the order of 2.1 meter and the top flange thickness is about 200, 275 okay I just figured out how to view the questions people were, were sending me um, 
One question is, can you comment on deck rebar for skewed bridges? Um, generally, I believe that the number, the cutoff is uh, something like 10 degrees. Uh, ODOT recommends turning that 9 degrees to the girders, uh, just because your, your, your spans start to get very long if you skew the rebar on a heavy skew. You also don't want to get the, the two maps of rebar that close to parallel to each other. Uh, question is, how do you actually measure the twist using computer FE analysis such as MIDAS? Um, you can get, there are, there are many methods in MIDAS. You can get node, measured node rotations in MIDAS. You can also, if you have a, a multiple node element, like a, like a plate element girder, you can, you can look at deflections between uh, nodes in that element to, to measure the deflections. Like if you're looking at the, the slope of the web, you can take the top and bottom node of the web and get a, a differential slope between those two. Uh, what type of connection between the cross frames and the girders is used in the FE model? Um, the, uh, we're using a rigid link between the, the cross frame elements and the girders. If you go to a really detailed plate element model, you could directly connect those. Or you could put in the, the uh, intermediate stiffeners and connect those directly to the cross frames. We've never gone that detailed, generally for design purposes. Uh, generally, it's a rigid link between the, generally the flange node directly to the, the truss element. Uh, in the 2D grid model with truss bracing, how do the offset of the brace form the center line of the beam is modeled? Oh, that's that again. So it's talking about the 2D, the 2D grid model with the truss bracing. We used rigid links between the girder elements and the, and the truss members to, to model that link. So we just assume that the, the stiffeners there provide a rigid connection. Uh, question, is the presentation available for download? I, um, I believe Midas is going to put that up. If they don't and you want to have it, email me and I can, I can get it to you. Um, There's a question about integral wind bends on skewed bridges, and, and uh, yes, that uh, an, an integral wind bend is basically a, an in cross frame, except it's it's much much more stiff. So the same policy applies that for a heavily skewed bridge, you would you would leave that unpoured until after the deck pour, because that will that will restrain those girders at the end and force them to, to twist just beyond the end bent if it's in place. And it'll put very high stresses in the flanges. Um, question about shell elements. Um, for this, for the purpose of what we're doing, a, a shell element and a thick plate element would be the same thing. It's just, it's just an element that can take bending along with in-plane forces. And it's, uh, it's probably the most appropriate thing to model a web action in a girder. There's a question about Ashto recommending a, a 10 KSI allowance for flange lateral bending. I think that's if you have staggered cross frames. I'm not sure exactly what provision of the code you're, you're talking about. But it, I think as long as your cross frames are, are in line across the width of the bridge, you don't need to consider that. I'm not sure if that's in the current Ashto code, but I know that that was there at some point that you put an allowance. When you have staggered cross frames, you need to make an allowance for flange bending if you're not doing a detailed analysis. 
Then there's a question about staggering the diaphragms rather than have, having diaphragms in each bay. And uh, yeah, I, I know there is, there is a school of thought that there are advantages to that. It, it does put more bending in the flanges because you're forcing you know, that torsion into the flanges. It does soften up your cross frame connections. If you were going to do that, I would recommend that you do a model including the uh, including elements for the flanges, you know, a 3D model of some sort, and, and look at that lateral bending stress. Question is the method of detailing the diaphragm fit placed on the plans in Ohio. It's it's in their uh, material specs for steel girders. It, by default, it is steel dead load fit. If it's going to be anything other, there needs to be a plan note stating that. That's all the questions I'm seeing so far. If you, if you do want me to send you the presentation, my email again is, is travis.butts. Here it is right here. Travis.butts at purchasenipal.com. Feel free to contact me with any questions or I can send you the presentation. All right, Travis, thank you again for answering the questions. Um, so please send us, uh, if you have any more questions, to Travis or send it to our email at Midas Microsoft at MidasUser.com. Uh, we will be sharing the recording uh, in a couple of hours. And uh, if you have, if you want the uh, presentation files, you can also uh, contact Travis. And thank you so much, everybody, and uh, you have a great day. Uh, I will be ending this session and waiting for your emails. Thank you. Bye. Profile, audit geometry material properties accurately in the model. Another challenge that was faced was the excessive amount of flexural reinforcing that was originally required in the band beam. And because of this, um, there is an issue of proper concrete placement because of a congested, congested area for the re for regular rain. What we have done was to use internal post tensioning to replace the flexural reinforcing and as a result um, all these internal post tensioning that is in the cab beam were accurately defined in the model and also in the construction stage analysis This picture is showing uh, one of the picture for the construction stage. And this picture is showing uh, the internal tendons that were defined in the cab beam. The next slide is showing the wandering effect. This is the pure column, the end segment that were cast integrally together with the activation of the internal tendons in the cab beam. Segment 1 erection, segment 2 erection, so on and so forth. tensioning of the 42 meter span, erection of the 36 meter span segments. Note that there's no post tensioning for the 36 meter span yet. Post tensioning for the 36 meter span with construction loading.
once the model for construction stage analysis was done, then you can define your moving load. The program offer, offers you the Canadian and Astro RFD code. Traffic links can be defined based on beam or plate elements. The program can consider a number of sub-load cases and perform independent analysis analysis of each sub-load case and provide the maximum and minimum results at a particular location or run combined analysis of all sub-load cases and provide the maximum and minimum results. One thing that is worth noting was that the dynamic load factor in the Canadian code it was all, all it is automatically built in in the program. Um, what tip, what engineers, what Canadian engineers do was to um, either factor down the the dynamic 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 load load factor, or they will um, they will do the factoring um, in the post processing stage. Um, in the next version of Matisovo, um, this will be changed to allow the users, the Canadian Canadian users, to manually enter the dynamic load factor. After you run the analysis, um, the designer or the designer can use the tenant time dependent loss graph to check or compare the tenant stresses in the field and the theoretical values based on the model. And in take Calgary West LLT as an example, the difference was within 5%. So the it can be ensured that the tenant stressings was the proper level of tenant stressings was acquired during construction. Next one, let's talk about the moving load tracer. The moving load tracer, tracer was used to determine the location of the applied traffic loads that determines the maximum or minimum forces. In other words, it shows you the influence line. This function was often used to determine the location of the applied loads that can produce the maximum deflection or forces under a certain load case. And this is the end of my presentation. To wrap it up, um, let's go over some of the some of the advantages of post tension box girder. The advantages of post tension box girder using cemental construction methods are reduction in cost and construction time, improved quality quality control, flexibility. Easy maintenance and ins ins inspection, and excellent torsional strength and aesthetic pleasing. Some of the design issues include the sheer torsion bending moment under the ultimate low cases. You also have to check the anchorage blocks and deviators for bursting effect and also construction loading, wind load, earthquake loads. And you also have to consider the stresses within the segments and at joints. And more importantly, uh, fatigue and deflection. Some of the challenges that were faced during the construction of Calgary West LLT include um, the mother nature, the weather, existing commercial buildings and traffic, the curve alignment of the guideway, and the active railway. Some of the useful modeling techniques I found were nodes and elements renumbering, um, provide structural groups and boundary groups as work is being uh, progressed or your model is being um, progressed.
and also try to maintain a constant unit during model definition stage. Very often, if when you are defining your material, um, sometimes you are changing the, the unit, um, and occasionally you could um, have another unit that was out of your control and you can end up having a, a very large properties or very small properties and that can give you a very unreasonable result so my recommendation is to try during your design definition stage try to maintain a constant unit and the last one is the moving load tracer I have another video to show you that is the end of the presentation um, here here I'm showing this slide to demonstrate um, some of the design resources that are going to be useful for uh, engineers that are designing the cemental concrete bridge um, uh, um, bridges Thank you for your time.